Hi, everyone. Welcome to video two of day three of the Sustainability Challenge. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with Joel Pennington from Avim, uh, who's an expert in VR and AR. And uh, let me introduce Joel. We're going to then talk about um, how VR and AR is going to improve construction quality and speed, get into the topic of digital twins, and show uh, some tool that we've built. Hey, Joel, welcome. Hey, Marty. How you going? Good. So, Joel, you're with Vim. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Vim and what you do there? Sure. Well, uh, I re run the uh, product development team at Vim. I'm the head of product. Um, but what that basically means is I, I get to make cool real-time tools and apps and services uh, for the built environment. And so you've got a long history in VR and AR, right? You uh, you were, uh, what was your title at Autodesk? You were like the chief poobah of VR and AR when they had something to compete with uh, with the gaming engines out there, right? Well, yeah, I was helping drive strategy company-wide. Um, prior to that, uh, I was building VR for uh, film production before VR was cool. Um, yeah, and you and actually got to work on Avatar with James Cameron, right? I did, yeah. I actually spent three years, my first three years at Autodesk, um, working directly for Jim and his team to build a new virtual camera, uh, which uses AR and VR um, for the Avatar sequels. And so I'm quite excited to see a decade later um, the fruits of that labor this December with the cool. first of the sequels coming out. Um, but you know, even before that, the 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 work I did at Disney and EA Sports um, was this interplay between the physical and the digital ever, ever since the late 90s. Um, and it always revolved around real-time data, whether it's objects or people or buildings and how they work in physical and digital relationships um but i actually always wanted to be an architect and i <laughs> went to a special high school in canada that taught me architecture on um minicad on an old apple computer in the mid 90s and so i started working for architects locally and um realized that maybe measuring as built wasn't always as exciting as it was cracked up to be. So they, <laughs> they threw this 3D thing at me and I quickly changed career tra trajectory and went into film and game production. Yeah, there's actually quite a broad overlap of that. When I was an architect back in the early 90s in San Francisco, there were a lot of my colleagues who went off into the game and 3D industries for, for that. And so there's always been kind of this cross-pollination. But now, you know, VR and AR is coming to construction and this is pretty exciting because you get to apply what you did in the movie uh, business to to actual building of buildings. And so maybe you get to be a different type of architect. Right. Yeah, possibly. Um, I think the the ability to get instant expertise um, to to folks out in the field um, is like the promise of spatial computing, VR and AR. Awesome. Let, let's talk a little bit about that. I want to show um, on screen this um, research that was done in using mixed reality to do actual construction of uh, electrical systems. Uh, this yeah. was uh, a thesis, uh, which you can see the link here on the, the screen, where uh, Data coming out of Revit was taken into Unity and put into augmented reality glasses to determine whether if using that method versus teaching how to assemble um, the pieces of the electrical system using the drawings, what would be the benefit of using a mixed reality AR approach. And the paper essentially shows that mixed reality improved the um the the assemblies by reducing the number of mistakes made by 75% and then from yeah. the final assemblies uh improving the number that were correct by more than 50%. So this is uh just one study but it indicates that if you apply these technologies that can mix 
um, what is to be built in the virtual world with the environment you're in in the real world and allow people to understand in a in a very direct experiential fashion what it is they have to do next that it can really remove um, a lot of the barriers and eliminate a lot of the mistakes that people get from not understanding the, the what they're trying to do uh, that's right in front of them. Totally. Um, and that, um, you know, that, that uh, hypothesis is not an isolated case. There are, there are others that have proven that giving work instructions um, where you are, you know, your hands are on the tools, your eyes are up looking at the work that you're doing and you, you're not distracted, um, offer the uh, similar or, um, you know, maybe even better results. Everything from changing out wiring harnesses in large uh, wind turbine prop boxes to doing um, bathroom pod stud layout um ar can give that instant expertise and that's actually pretty important because the the con the buildings today uh, especially in commercial construction are more akin to computers and high-end harder than they are to the old brick and mortar facilities that our grandparents or great-grandparents built They've got tons and tons of tech in them. They're very complex. They lots require of yeah, lots, yeah, of lots of sensors. Lots of sensors. Management systems. Yeah, and um, and for good reasons. You know, we we know that our buildings pollute a significant amount. That there's a ton of waste. And we want to reduce that as much as possible. Um, but the other thing is that there's a there's a big drop in the workforce available to build and right. operate these facilities. And so you've got this really big gap that's forming, has already formed and is forming more as um, the boomers continue to retire and enjoy their well-earned retirements. But uh, there isn't a force coming in to backfill. And we're making- Yeah, well, <clears throat> we'll I'll be talking about that tomorrow in, in video one tomorrow where I'll cite some, um, some things gathered by McKinsey that shows that's the number one problem facing uh, contractors right now is that workforce shortage. Yeah. And so we got to think of types of technologies that can uh, augment, pun intended, <laughs> right? <laughs> can augment the workforce so that they can do more um, at a higher degree of quality and specificity, um, but, um, but not have to go back to school and uh, get you know trained up on uh, practice for for many years because we simply can't afford it. So now for this technology to impact the work, what's interesting is you have to have a the hardware to be able to put on and and literally see what you're doing, but yeah. you also need the data about what it is you're going to be doing with how you're going to be doing it. And what's interesting to me, and I'll flash this up on screen right now as we talk, that you know the appropriate hardware is really available to anybody right now on Amazon for less than four hundred dollars. The issue is that the the apps and the data to actually make this manifest to the workers in the field is lagging behind, and data is a huge big problem part of this. To some extent, um, you know we haven't in the challenge really talked about this yet, but there's this this gap that everybody in the industry realizes between BIM, right, which is for drawings versus VDC is the typical term for a more detailed model that is actually for the construction of the project. You want to comment on that a little bit, maybe? Sure. Um, the the like fabrication level models or, or constructability models are much more complex than design documentation that, you know, you send to get approved and stamped. Um, as a result, the what typically gets put into VR or AR devices for like a design review is um, is like a nice visualization, but it's not it it's not um, the thing that the builder needs. The builder needs all that rich data, and they need it all so that when they go and do unplanned tasks as part of their daily chores or daily work they um they continue to have all of those work instructions and data available to them yeah so the data pipeline um that would enable such a thing is immature right now and we're not going to solve that today and we're not going to solve that in the challenge that's a bigger problem but one of the things that i highlighted in in the first video today was the fact that 
given the promise versus the actual result of still having almost 20% rework on the jobs on average, there's a lack of trust with owners that this is going to have the impact that it was previously promised after 20 years of being in the market. So one of the things that I think you and I have discussed is coming up with a way of measuring the input data to at least from an everyday standpoint, understand what's there. So if someone at a contractor gets a Revit file or an owner who's asked for uh, you know, their BIM data, wants to know, okay, how good is this? Let's just say for the first use case of understanding sustainability measures, yeah. uh, what could what could be something that makes that a lot more visible and manifest for someone who's not trained in the uh, idiosyncrasies of BIM, like the BIM manager at an engineering firm, but rather someone who's just a manager in construction or just a manager in a real estate portfolio, so they could understand do I have data that's ready to do certain things or not? Yeah, so we at Vim have actually, uh, you know, with you at um, GBH, have put together a um, a web-based uh, product that allows for owners, these untrained uh, non-BIM specialists, to get get an answer about their project and get it quickly. Um, and be able to hold their consultants to uh, a new degree of accountability. Or just have the consultants look at it and see where they are. And that sounds fantastic, and probably everybody's <laughs> thinking right now, oh, that's the catch. But that, what I want to point out yeah. is we've done this as a service to the industry. So we're, yeah. we're, we're providing these reports for free so that you can take your project data and understand where you stand relative to – sustainability, whether that data is going to be useful in driving sustainability outcomes like uh, lead or carbon footprinting, or is the data there to help enable you measuring it? Because the first thing, if you want to improve something, you first have to be able to measure it. So what we're trying to do is give these reports so people can measure what they have currently in the data yeah. pipeline because the pipeline's immature. And one of the things I wanted to point out was when we originally came up with Revit, we realized some people were going to do a complete model because they wanted a complete 3D model. Some people were going to model just enough to make the permit drawings, and they were going to have these weird things where, you know, the minute you got away from what was used to generate the drawing, there would be all these weird things, you know, sitting off to the side. And we find that when we run these Revit models through this reporting engine is that it exposes that sorts of things to the uninitiated so that can really tell what the quality of the data you've got for doing these sort of downstream engineering analysis are. So do you want to show a couple of these? I'd love to. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get right into it. Uh, so I'll go full screen here. So what we're looking at is um, cloud.vimadc.com. So this is our cloud uh, product. And I have actually uploaded a number of different Vim files. and um, some of them have got reports that we can look at. And uh, so let's take a look at one here. This is... Let me interrupt you one second. So oh, sure. tomorrow we are going to show you how to do this with your own project data. Right now we're just trying to show you what you can get from these reports. Right. So here is, um, here is some, you know, scoring based on uh, lead readiness through energy modeling to embody carbon. And... Um, and you can see that this project, this is a, a model, uh, Revit model checker sample project, actually scores very high. So this is and, a sample model from the BIM health check that, that Autodesk has produced. And I guess one of the reasons we're doing this is there might be a lot of BIM coordinators out there familiar with this model. Yeah. And if we um, take a look inside, we can see, okay, wow, we got great scores and we can see how it's weighted. So, um, and by the way, this weighting and how the score is measured. What what I love about your team, Marty, was that it's their knowledge that goes into this. So it's it's their own daily practice that actually informs how this report is put together. Yeah, so you're seeing, what you're seeing on screen is the result of combining some tribal knowledge about Revit and yeah. the way that Revit data is inside Revit with the tribal knowledge at the various GBH companies and so the methodology that you see reflected in these reports was actually uh, put together by a lead fellow, um, the 
former lead uh, USGBC reviewer, a former past president of ASHRAE. So there's a lot of very specialized tribal knowledge within the company that was used to create the scoring methodology here to give you not just a bunch of data about the Revit model, but some insights about what it's useful for. And if you have gaps, where those gaps are so you can go and address them. Yeah, and so you can see here that, you know, pretty much across the board, we're looking really good, um, except mechanical. And if we were to dive into this, um, there are some built-in type parameters that are missing some of the, like, the key HVAC data types that your engineers um, look for so that they can um, understand the, um, the cost of uh, mechanical systems, but also a bunch of unassigned objects. So there's a ton of duct work and terminals, et cetera, that were not part of the actual assigned um, duct systems. Anyway, that this is an example of like a well, pretty wait, darn before good we project. before we move on to some other examples, let's just look at the sure. various reports. Carbon scoring, for instance, the MEP side is only considered as operational, not as embodied. That's under the current carbon scoring rules. So. The weighting and the methodology that's behind this, first off, is uh, formal. So we'll have a little um, addenda video explaining what the methodology is so you can understand how we scored this. But also, it's based off the current practice. So if in the future uh, the embodied carbon uh, uh, scoring metrics take into account the embodied carbon in the MEP systems, then it'll get added into our benchmark. But at this point in time it doesn't and christina on day two all about carbon went into a lot of these details so i'm just trying right. to connect the fact that a lot of things she discussed on day two is actually implemented in the methodology that we're showing in these reports but so obviously this one scores pretty well because it's autodesk's you know benchmark sample model let's take a look at some other projects where it might be a little more obvious that we're missing some data sure sure let's take a look at uh at this project right here so this is called oak fire and um, scoring, uh, uh, you know, not as great. We're we're getting some some lower scores here. And we take a look at the um, the lead report. We can see that predominantly because we we have no plumbing in the project, yep. no FF&E, and mechanical is almost empty. And and if I look at electrical, those are things that typically the architect would be placing, like the light fixtures and the switches and fire yeah. alarms and things like that. So even in an architectural model, it'll probably get you, you know, halfway there with lead readiness. But the but the rest of it is uh, is is pretty essential to being ready to do the and, and lead itself will require energy modeling. So we didn't want to double count it. Right. Uh, but but there are pieces of it in both. And if we wanted to, so we're like, okay, wow, that that's pretty, you know, insightful. Um, we can actually just click on this Oak Fire project to look at it in 3D. So, um, you know, here it is right here. Let me double click on this to zoom in so we can get a better better view. And um, it's pretty neat looking, but I I am guessing that we are just uh, you know, just missing some of those key components. So we have a lightweight version of the project in the cloud. This is for a couple of reasons, so that someone uploading the data can check to make sure that, you know, a bunch of stuff wasn't deleted or, or is missing. I'm going to just uh, stop sharing my screen there for a moment. I think we're we're pretty good on the report side of things, Marty. And I think it is tomorrow we'll be going through some of how how people can make these reports themselves. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So cool. we wanted to show you what um, we have built uh, in collaboration with our friends at Vim to provide this type of reporting on your project data. Tomorrow we'll actually show you uh, how you, if you wish, can uh, create this reporting for your own projects to see where you stand. Uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of people who, who want to see where they stand relative to the kind of benchmarks that we've shown you today. So make sure to join us uh, tomorrow on day four of the Sustainability Challenge. All right, thanks, Marty. Thanks, Joel.